Hi everyone and welcome. We are here today to join a huge amount of experts and panels and possibly even a couple of interesting people around the world. My name is Carolina Olsen and I have the immense joy today of introducing the Quit Conference 2020. For almost 25 years, in different shapes and sizes, we have introduced people with special skills and tried to look into the future. This year, we're focusing on AI and humans' place in that technology. And to start off today, we are going to delve a little bit into the more ethical, uh, ideological and possibly philosophical perspectives of AI. With me to do this, I have two experts from vastly different fields, but with unique perspectives that we're trying to make sure that you guys get the best possible introduction for this day. So I'm going to introduce my two panelists uh, and they're with us here on Zoom today. Because like you've noticed, oh, this is the first time we're doing this completely digital. So thanks to our sponsor, we've been able to provide this conference digitally from Linsha Bing Congress and uh, uh, Conference. And we're also enjoying the presence of uh, Facebook today. So you're joining us on Facebook. And with me to have this discussion, I would like to introduce Krista and Peter. Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> so where are you guys? Where are you sitting now? At home. <laughs> Where is home? In my, in my home office. It's leading a uh, Stockholm, outside of Stockholm City. Yes. So we're in Linköping, you're in Stockholm. And Peter, where are you? I'm in my office at Lund University. Ah, Lund. So this is the great thing about going digital, that you guys can join us, even if we don't have to travel. But for, I would like you to get a chance to introduce yourselves a little bit so that the audience have an idea of why we've invited you to this discussion. So maybe, Kista, would you like to go first? Who are you and why are you here to discuss AI with us? Uh, well, I work as a publisher and CEO of a uh, non-fiction publishing uh, company called Free Tanke. We publish popular science and philosophy and also some titles in artificial intelligence like Nick Boström and um, uh, Ole Hegström and some others. But I, I also, so I work as a publisher and author actually, but I have a background, my academic background is in computer science. So, so back in the, the late 80s and early 90s, I was into computer science with a focus on artificial intelligence, which was something very different from what it is now. So, so you guys know more about the current state of technology than I do, I, I think, because I left the IT industry about 20 years, 15, 20 years ago. Welcome. We're very happy to have you. And I know that you have some unique perspectives here. And Peter, you are quite a familiar face, I think, for some people that have been tuning into the Quit conference. Do you have any idea how many times you've been joining us I lost count. <laughs> as always we're really really happy to have you so so peter who are you and, and why do you take part in this discussion i'm currently a senior professor of cognitive science but i have a background in both computer science and in philosophy and i wrote my first ai program in 1971 that's way before most of you were born and that was a program on logic theorem proving written in Lisp, which was a terrible programming <laughs> language. And, uh, but since then, I've, I've followed the development of AI from a, well, philosophical cognitive science point of view. Last few years, I've been working to, partly with a group in um, University of Technology in Sydney, um, in Australia, or on social robotics. And I've been involved in an EU project involving ICAB robots. So I have some background in robotics as well. So you keep busy, I can, I can tell. Uh, so maybe then, Peter, you are the perfect person to ask this question because some of the people who are listening might be working with AI and some are just interested. So how about we try to uh, just clarify a little, little bit for the audience. When we speak of AI, what do we mean? And is there a difference between AI and robotics? And how, how does that fit together? 
Yeah, that's a very good point. I mean, to distinguish. Okay, first I should say that AI is a moving target. I mean, when I was young, it was all about uh, logic programming and was re reasoning in logic. That was everything that was. Then came the neural networks in the 1970s. They had some successes, but then that was the AI winter in the 90, 1990s. And then things came back 10, 15 years ago with deep learning. And now AI is almost equated with the deep learning uh, results. Uh, but I guess we can discuss more about that. Then robotics and AI is not at all the same because robotics has to do with doing things in the world. And most AI systems don't do anything in the world. They categorize, they solve problems, and, and but they don't act. And acting is, is a problem that is much more difficult than, than uh, being an intelligent system uh, in, in, in any sense. And I think that uh, the questions in robotics are quite different from the questions that people normally talk about in AI. So for me, it's very important to distinguish AI and robotics. And uh, I think that in the popular press, this distinction is not often made. This is interesting. And maybe we'll start here, actually, because this is this is something that I think we also have to try to suss out a little bit. Uh, and maybe from your point of view, how much knowledge do people in society have about these questions? And and what do we need to do to improve it if we need to improve it? Uh, how do you how do you find it? Kista, do you want to start? Well, let me first just say that I, I I feel very nostalgic when I hear Peter talking about because when I was a teenager, I was passionate about programming in Lisp and Prolog, which is exactly what you're talking about. And, you know, I read this Douglas Hofstadter book, Gerda Lescherbachen, that got me completely into the, this area. But then the AI winter came, and that was just after I left the university. So, of course, that was a big disappointment but now it's coming back which i enjoy a lot even though I, i i see it from the side so to speak anyway you your question is what do people know in society quite little i think uh, first of all obviously people are not computer scientists or educated in computer science um, but also ai has become a popular culture thing uh, creating a lot of um, uh, misunderstandings of course a lot of uh, a lot of scare because it has this apocalyptic um, um, psychological effect on people are the robots going to take over or will there be a super intelligence that will get rid of humanity and so on so in that sense i think it's very important for people who know knows more about this to to write about it and talk about it the knowledge is low in society in general especially among politics politicians i think oh yeah we, we should get back to that but i've, I've seen peter that you're you're nodding a lot you, you find this as well that there's a lot of misunderstandings and misconceptions Yeah, I mean, the, the media are mainly reporting AI successes, and very little is devoted to discussing the, the drawbacks, what the AI can't do. I mean, there are myths, and, and people like Bostrom and others say that AI is going to take over the world within the next hundred years, and I don't think that will happen because there are so, still so many problems. And furthermore, people confuse AI with robotics, and I think that's partly due to all these films we see about robots like iRobot and so on where you have very smart robots walking on around in the world and and, and solving smart problems and, and so on these robots don't exist and it will be take a very long time before they will come into existence so i think that people have to Uh, optimistic, uh, or I should say, too, I too big um, uh, expectations about what can that be done with robots. Uh, uh, the, the robots we see, they are they are vacuum cleaners and and, um, and lawn mowers, and they are about uh, as smart as cockroaches. So it's not uh, it's not very interesting, as a matter of fact. Let me give you one, just one example of this. Uh, I mentioned Douglas Hofstadter recently and uh, earlier, and I have quite a lot of contact with him these days because I'm writing a book with him. And he recently wrote a wonderful essay about 
uh, AI translations, I mean, uh, systems translating between two languages. And he himself is a genius when it comes to languages. He speaks Russian and Chinese and, and French and Italian and Swedish even uh, perfectly. So he knows a lot about languages. And he wrote this essay giving examples on how extremely badly the translation systems work, even the best deep learning translation systems. He gave examples when they tried to translate pieces from Russian literature or, well, any, any language actually, and gave, gave very humorous and funny examples of, of how bad it is. Uh, and his take on this, he's told me many times that we are very, very long way to go before we can get a good translation in, in literary terms. But did, both of you have picked up on this, but is this then just the question of time? Is it the fact that we're not there yet? Or is it um, a more fundamental question of are we, are we even attempting to, to use it in, in the way we should? Uh, or are we just on testing stage, if you understand well, what I mean? I think mean. it's mainly a question of methodologies. I mean, AI, AI, deep learning work with neural networks. They are quite smart, they're quite efficient. But the only thing they can do is to categorize, I mean, find patterns in the world. They cannot act, they cannot reason, not very well at least, and they cannot take the context into, into account. And similarly with translation systems. I mean, the best translation system works on statistical patterns. So it's a statistical methodology, nothing to do with grammar or anything like that and again the context of the of the what is to be translated is is very dependent and that cannot be captured by these uh, statistical methods so for me it's a problem of of having methodolo methodologies that work for some areas uh, playing games uh, translating uh, categorizing and so on but these methodologies cannot be generalized so anything like general ai is very far away i think and the general AI is, is something that would be able to do many of these tasks at the same time. Is yes. that the distinction? Yeah. Uh, so if, if, if you think about a future where it's making all the decision for us, that is a general AI. So what, what, if we're looking at the JI that does exist, that does work, what kind of examples do we have there? Do we have anything well, I mean, that works? I, I mean, there, there is a big hype about uh, deep learning at the moment, and they are very good at categorizing. I mean, we, we have systems for face recognition that can be used for good and bad things. Uh, deep learning can solve uh, cancer diagnosis uh, quite well, maybe better than some doctors. Uh, the day before yesterday, there was uh, DeepMind announced a new, new system uh, that could uh, find the 3D structures of proteins given the sequences of the amino acids and that if that works that would be a great breakthrough in in in, uh, in biology i mean to to be able to understand how the how the proteins fold into into 3d so for these special problems we we have good solutions uh, or that will become good solutions on the other hand the um, uh, deep learning programs are very much dependent on on a um, what I've been trained on. They need a lot of training. You need hundreds of thousands of faces in order to do face recognition. You need lots of cancer cases to do cancer diagnosis and so on. And there are quite often biases built into these uh, training systems. So let me, can I give you one example? And that is in, uh, in some American courts have been using AI programs to give sentences to standard uh, cases like uh, shoplifting or theft or traffic accidents and so on. And they've been trained on a number of similar cases and, and they can give out appropriate sentences to people. However, it turned out that these systems are biased against black people because they were trained on re real cases and real judges are biased against black people. So the biases we have in the training uh, systems, in the training examples, they will turn out in the, um, in the uh, solutions as well. Can I give you one more example? And that is in, in April this year, uh, Amazon's um, uh, inventory management system broke down because the top demand in, in April was for toilet paper, the second demand was for face masks, and the third demand was for hand sanitizers. And that has never happened before. So the system went havoc because it couldn't handle this non-normal situation. As long as the situation is standard, as, as long as the system has been trained, then it may work well. But as soon as we leave the normal cases, then it breaks down.
Yeah, and obviously this is really important to, to and I think maybe Kista, you want to add some into this because this oh. has to do with with the, how we view the possibility and who has the power to impact these solutions, right? Let, let me just mention one thing and, and actually ask Peter uh, something. Uh, an, uh, another example, obviously, where AI is doing well is chess playing. Uh, um, um, the, and, and I want to ask you this question because I don't know the evidence for what I'm going to say now, but I was told by an international uh, grandmaster who I know, a chess player, professional chess player, that normally when you show a chess uh, professional chess player you show a game played by a professional chess player and a computer but you show it on on a piece of paper the moves so to speak the professional chess player can normally say which side was played by a computer and which side was played by a human but with a new chess playing program deep learning program that is not possible anymore they can't tell which side, black or white, was played by a computer. Is that correct? And why do you think that is so? Yeah, I mean, this is a version of what's called the Turing test. I mean, whether you can yeah, really exactly. distinguish a, a human from a uh, from a machine. And of course, yeah. uh, now I, I think that the really best players can still tell because the the uh, computer plays some, some uh, I mean, the best computer programs plays moves that are so... Uh, Thinking so way, much way ahead, uh, and in a way that humans don't do it. Uh, and actually, I've been told that Magnus Carlsen, the current uh, world champion, has changed his style of playing. I mean, he's pushing his pawns much more frequently than before because he's learned from the computer programs that uh, this is a good, uh, good strategy. So um, I'm, I'm not sure. It might be no, a normal person can't tell the difference. Uh, definitely not. But I still think okay. that the top players can could tell a difference okay yeah and this is we hear about this Turing test uh, r- regularly i want to say because this for some some people this is like the holy grail of of hmm. uh, ai where we can reach a point where you cannot tell the difference but like you've said we, we're not there yet but but how do we need to approach the, this Turing test, Turing test is not very good because it presumes that humans are intelligent <laughs> Hmm. And this may be, this, this is a funny comment because I want to get back to this and I didn't want to say it in that way. You know, like, it's, should humans really do this? Because if there's anything that we've learned from history is, is how easily we fall into this, uh, this bias and this uh, repeating of, of um, bad behavior, so to speak, uh, that you mentioned already, Peter, that the, the AI, AI tends to do the same thing. But, and and how, how should we approach this to try to avoid as much as these problems as we possibly can? Do we, do we need, is it all about information or is it about a state of mind? What, what, what's the next step for that, do you think? You start, Peter. Yeah, I start, okay. Uh, well... It depends on what we expect from a, 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 a in, 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 an AI system. Do we expect it to solve particular problems, or do we expect it to behave like a human? And if we expect it to behave like a human, we need to know much more about how human works. And this is the topic of cognitive science. So I think that's a, that's an important uh, aspect, of course. But if you if you want an AI system that can drive an autonomous car, it doesn't know have to know very much about uh, humans. Okay, it has to know about how pedestrians and, and bikers are behaving, but uh, that's maybe not the, the, the worst problem. Um, so uh, it all depends on what is the the aim of the a- a- AI systems. Uh, the, the problems show up mainly in social robotics when you want to have interactions between between humans and, and, and robots. And the, the, there we have still very immense problems and, and the current systems have no, no chance of, 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 of solving these problems, in my opinion. But there is another aspect of this which I find interesting, and that is even if we don't sort of get fooled by a, a, an AI to be a human, I think there is a big um, risk, so to speak, that uh, humans will develop emotions uh, towards robots, uh, at even at a quite primitive level. I mean, you've probably all seen this film on YouTube where this uh, uh, big dog, this uh, crab-like robot is walking in the forest and then he walks out on a frozen lake and uh, he's very good at walking, this robot actually, and but he gets very slippery on this lake. 
And then a man comes and tries to keep, kick him so he falls. And the immediate emotion you get is that was not nice to do that. And for God's sake, it's a robot. We shouldn't feel like that, but we actually do. And this, I think, can also create some problems in the future. Yeah. Oh, I totally agree. I mean, we have we project emotions, anything that behaves like an animal, we, we, we think it's an animal. And yeah. that, that's why I think it's a mistake to make humanoid robots, because then we project, we, we, we expect too much of the, of, of the robots, both in terms of interaction, but also in terms of emotional uh, responses. And we, we, we can't expect anything like that. It's much better to build not even animal-like um, robots. And most robots that we have, uh, they don't look very much like animals. Okay, I said that the the um, uh, vacuum cleaner looks like a cockroach, and uh, that's maybe uh, what it is. But uh, most industrial robots are just stupid uh, arms moving around and, and solving problems very efficiently, very quickly, but very limited uh, range of a uh, very limited range of problems. So this anthropomorphism is is dangerous in in, in robotics. Yeah. I totally agree to that. But can we avoid that, though? Because like, I have friends who name their little uh, vacuum cleaners because it, does, it has this sentient presence. It's doing these things without me, which will, which, which will make me do, give it this kind of lifelike quality. It, can it be avoided or sh- should, should we maybe just deal with it and, and see to make sure we don't build in the wrong sort of reactions? Yeah, but I think in some cases it can be good, of course. I mean, we all remember the Tamagotchi trend. Uh, and, and I mean, in certain cases where people are very lonely or, or whatever, it might be a good idea to project feelings like that. So it's not always a bad thing. But I think it will create problems. To, to be a realist, I think you have to see that. I think you're right, and I've heard a lot of experts talking about this because it's also as as far as it goes, it's a new sort of uh, area of law <laughs> when it yeah. comes to uh, comes to this kind of behavior. That can you treat a robot like a car? Is it the same thing or not? And and this we have not yet gotten to the point no. of exploring. So maybe maybe that's far in the future. As, as listening to you, Peter, it certainly is far in the future. Uh, what do I, you I think? Do know, is, and you know. I, well, you know, also, uh, we will obviously see movements and organizations fighting for robot rights and uh, <clears throat> moral, you know, raising the moral status of, 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 of machines and so on. And I mean, just look at, at, at the world today with all the conspiracy theories out there, uh, QAnon and all these things. I mean, of course, this will create problems as well. But, it, you know, that's unavoidable, I think. And maybe that is also something that society needs to deal with. Like it's the next step if we start using these technologies more and more. Uh, yeah, but I mean, you, society can't really deal with it. I mean, you get, look at America today, the, the conspiracy theories that are flourishing around the Trump presidency. I mean, they are so extreme and so bizarre. So it's beyond help. <clears throat> But what what kind of behavior is it that that brings out that? What why why are we seeing so much of that now? Oh, if I can stick out my neck, really, I would say it's a matter of education. I mean, people people uh, who believe in conspiracy theories uh, uh, need to know more about the basic principles of the world. I mean, for instance, if you believe that. 5G masks can transmit COVID. I mean, you you need some some knowledge about viruses. So. I'm glad you said that because I was hoping that would be the answer. <laughs> because we're, we we need to go back to this, I think, because as far as AI goes, education is also a huge part, right? To what we're saying here now, what is possible, what is being done, and what do we need to think about in the future? But it's not obvious who whose responsibility that is. Who do you think? Well, first of all, I think uh, I think it might be a too easy explanation to say it's all about education. Uh, there is a fantastic research done by a professor Dan Cahan in America on the topic of politically motivated reasoning, uh, showing that people interpret uh, data and statistics um, 
very much according to the identity they want to uphold, the political identity. And the problem, what he has shown, is if people are intellectual or, or if people are um, rather educated in, um, in certain areas, they are actually even better to cling on to the wrong interpretation of facts. So I think, I mean, of course, education is important of course, if you're uneducated, you will believe more silly things. But you also need training in uh, critical thinking, cr the, the art of thinking clearly, basically. And that is something else than education. You need that as well. I, I am happy you're contradicting me here or, or complimenting me here, Christa, because I, I I'm totally agree with you that education, yeah. education is not enough. There are very smart people who believe in in conspiracy theories. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. But th there is another fact, and that is uh, we need to be exposed to a lot of different theories. I mean, we, we tend to, I mean, the modern technology has l led us to live in, live in these bubbles of information. We, we, we don't want to leave our bubbles of com comfort when, when it comes to our political or moral beliefs. Yeah. And you mean, you, you mean just go out on Facebook and look at what kind of groups there are. I, I recently joined a group on Facebook as a, just for fun, a group with about 30,000 people, American, uh, called Christians Against Dinosaurs. They don't believe that dinosaurs ever existed. It's just a big uh, conspiracy, for example. But then there is also another group called Dinosaurs Against Christians Against Dinosaurs. So it equals out. <laughs> that is actually not a bad example because this is the with the amount of information that we get exposed to it's obviously getting more and more difficult to find the authorities. Like, who, who is telling the story I should listen to? And if we go back to the AI issues, we're going to meet some of the authorities here during the day, at least the authorities in our region. Uh, but who is it we should be listening to when it comes to uh, the development and the possible Im applications of AI? Who knows their stuff here? It's a very good question, and it's a very difficult one. I mean, who is an expert? Uh, that's uh, that's uh, d d very difficult. I mean, we see this now in the debate around COVID. I mean, there are people who believe in that, and there are people who believe in total opposites, even among the experts. We simply have too little knowledge. Uh, but on the other hand, you have to find some criteria for the persons who have worked the most and who have the best knowledge in, in, in the area and so on. Uh, science is always a, a debate about what is uh, good and uh, what is a bad interpretation of the, of the data. But still, I mean, science has this peer review system. You have to expose your ideas to others. They have to be criticized and, and, and tested and so on. So I think that the scientific me methodology in, in, in at large is is a good way to go but it it's uh, it's not sufficient and you can't expect to, to science to have clear answers to all, all the problems there are other other ways to go as well Kista, your point of view well, I just agree with that it's completely right of course and 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 I think we, we have to understand that if my, uh, AI research involves so many different areas I mean of course computer science but also, cognitive science and also philosophy actually and psychology and so there's so many dimensions so I think it's very important that you get some kind of uh, what you call it in English interdisciplinary uh, uh, work uh, here maybe even more than universities are used to do what you say Peter are, is that a problem in universities that you work in your closed areas too much maybe I don't know it, it's become more specialized the last uh, well, it's the last century, I should say. Yeah. And of course, yeah, as as a scientist, you're not very rewarded for for going out in the public. I mean, that's what not what gives you merit. And I think that's bad. I mean, you should you should yeah. your career should be better if you took part in the debate, uh, public debate. Uh, and uh, that's not yes. the case uh, as things are now. But I mean, you mentioned philosophy. Let me just come back and give you two examples from from Swedish debate and. Uh, one is uh, also Wigfors' book on alternative facts, which is really yeah. a good epistemological book. Uh, create, uh, yeah. This one. <laughs> no, no uh, advertisement here. Anyway, uh, uh, that is a good epistemological analysis of 
what goes wrong when you start believing in alternative facts. The other one is yeah. Jonah Bornemark's book on the, the renaissance of the unmeasurable, who is criticizing all this, actually criticizing in an indirect way AI systems that are locked into uh, rule systems. And, and, and in particular, she's criticizing new public management. Starting out from medieval philosophers, which is uh, kind of uh, kind of interesting in the in the uh, situation. But I think that philosophy really has a role of of uh, bringing forward the the, uh, the problems that are are uh, so important in the current situation. So. Well, I think we should uh, post the titles and the authors of these books because I think maybe some people in the audience are interested to learn more about this. So maybe you can help me to to get the information I need for that. Because I I do think that you have a very, very good point here uh, that we need to look from a broader perspective and maybe from a layman's point of view, this is where we can start. We cannot start by delving into algorithms and trying to understand it from that point of view. But we also had one thing you mentioned earlier, Kista, is the politicians. And you were very quick to say that this is a this is a group that we need to address. What did you need, mean by that? What what do we need to do? Well, basically, politicians are, of course, not uh, technically... Mm, knowledgeable in this area so they base their opinions on the what you call it pop popular culture versions of the ai um, issues and uh, they are as we already talked about they are over dramatized both in the positive direction that it will solve a lot of things quite soon but also this apocalyptic vision of uh, ai killing us in the future um, I think that <clears throat> that is a psychological phenomena that has been uh, going through humanity for, I mean, forever, but it has taken different shapes. Uh, um, and sometimes it's, of course, valid, like the environmental threat right now. But uh, earlier, hundreds of years ago, it was the threat of hell. And it's the same kind of psychological aspects here that people are afraid that AI will take over the world, basically. Um, you understand what I mean? It's ma been made a lot of films on that topic now, and it's a big issue uh, in the public debate. That affects politicians a lot. Uh, and I think there is a big risk that they will make the wrong decisions based on that, these popular versions of the debate, rather than the knowledge that people like Peter and other have. <clears throat> it's interesting you bring that up. I think Friedrich Heinz might approach this subject a little bit because he's been part of some European commissions where they're actually trying to get some knowledge in place on what part of the threat or possibilities are actually valid to be dis discussed right now. So I'm hoping we'll get a little bit deeper into that uh, as we move along. Uh, Peter, you had uh, did you have a response as well? I saw you nodding there. Yeah, no, I, I agree with what Krista is saying, but there is one aspect I think is very important, and that is the question of having a good judgment in a, in a situation. Uh, uh, and this is a topic that has not been studied very, very well. What is meant by a human having a good judgment? And the thing I want to emphasize here is that AI systems have no judgment whatsoever. I mean, they can solve problems in, in specific areas. Sometimes they're, they're very smart, but they can't judge whether the solution is plausible or good or, or anything like that. They don't have this kind of metacognition that they can reason about their own, 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 own reasoning and, and judge um, uh, whether a solution is, is plausible or, uh, or not. So I think this is one of the major areas we, we need to continue with, both in philosophy, in cognitive science, and in, in, in computer science. That is what is meant by a good judgment. So how can we tell that, that something is based on a good judgment? And, and, and the second and even more uh, difficult problem is how can we implement it in, 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 in technical systems? And there, I think we, we, we are just groping in the dark um, uh, still. Yeah. But also, let me say one more thing. I mean, I'm not trying to say that there is no risks with AI at all. I mean, first of all, we have to we have to recognize that in, it, it doesn't really matter what kind of uh, theory of consciousness you have, uh, at least if it's not a religious idea that consciousness comes from outside. 
if you if you don't believe in that, then there is quite hard to find reasons not to think that computers could develop consciousness in principle at, at least. And uh, if you accept that, then of course we have to deal with that uh, one way or another. And also I think it's interesting to realize that uh, first we will get machines who will be able to simulate consciousness in a way that we makes us makes it indistinguishable from real consciousness. And that means that we will never know when they become conscious for real, because long before that, they will simulate consciousness in ways that we can't distinguish from real consciousness. So of course, this is a problem, potential problem. Yeah, but that, that, that's, of course, very much dependent on what we mean by consciousness. I mean, when we look at the chess playing computer, we think that we think that it thinks because it makes those smart moves and so on. Uh, but I wouldn't assign any consciousness in that case. The question is, what criteria would we have for for saying that something is conscious? And I, I think that's yeah. a uh, that's a very difficult problem still. And I, I still yeah. I think we're very far from it. Yeah, I agree. So maybe we're we're jumping ahead a bit when we're focusing on the problems with the the conscious AI. I think I think that that's obvious from this discussion. Doesn't mean, however, it's not something we have to consider. Uh, how do you feel about the the development of AI and how humans are using it? Are you optimistic or are you a little bit frightened? My, my answer is yes. Uh, <laughs> that is, I'm I'm both. <laughs> I'm optimistic that AI systems can help us uh, solve many practical, many routine problems in, in, in society. Uh, I'm pessimistic in that they will not have to be this kind of judgment that I was talking about. We still need humans who, who judge whether the solutions of an AI system is, is reasonable or not. So, I mean, take a, such a simple system as you're asking for a bank loan and they they um for buying a house or whatever uh these systems they they are taking a lot of facts about your economy and then they make a decision sometimes this decision is totally stupid and some some human being must be uh must judge whether the proposed made proposal made by the ai system is reasonable or not i don't think we can get around these uh these problems we can't trust the ai systems as uh, as as um, in, in, in particular, not when the situations are non, not normal. I mean, that's the and knowing what is not normal is is really the um, the hallmark of of uh, having a judgment. So this fear that some people have that the the computers will take all our jobs that's not something that you ascribe to them, Peter, because the humans are going to be needed in in roles in the future as well. The, the, the computers will take lots of jobs, not because of AI, yeah. because of development. I mean, all the all the uh, truck drivers will be replaced within, I guess, twenty years. Uh, uh, lots of building um, people will be uh, without jobs because you will have three D printed houses and, and 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 so on. So the job market has changed. It's changed the last two hundred years with industrial revolution. It will keep on changing. Uh, uh, so the job market will change, and hopefully more people will may be engaged in not doing routine jobs, but in making uh, um, uh, judgments about whether the, the solutions by the machines are, are good or not. Yeah, I, I completely agree. It will. I think it will mostly be of good. Actually, the labor market will change a lot by uh, robots, but and mostly it will be good because people will not do dangerous jobs or physically damaging jobs. But of course, not everyone has the the knowledge or even cognitive capacity to to do very qualified judgment jobs so there there will be also uh, problematic consequences of this change i think so but that's that's a part of how it's always been just as peter said so we just have to accept that hopefully yeah. more people can work in in hospitals and homes for elderly and so on i mean uh, we need uh, another economic system for that but uh, that's um, that's one way yeah, yeah. But like you said, things change. I remember when I was studying history, I read about this huge demonstration, actually in Norshopping, where I lived, 
where these people who used to drive the trucks with the ice for the old refrigerators, when you used to have a box that you put ice in, they had a huge protest, keep our jobs, keep our jobs. And obviously now ice truck driver is not a huge uh, career move. So things change and we adapt. Is that something that we we can kind of uh, push forward as a as a situation that's going to happen here as well? Is is it like things will change and will adapt, or do we need to be extra cautious with this development? I think it's the same as it has always been in history. I mean, back two hundred years ago, workers throw their shoes, their sabots, into the weaving machines to destroy them. That's why it's called sabotage. It was the sabot they throw in. Uh, I mean, it's always been like that. And this will happen again with the AI revolution, definitely. Because I think it's going to be a robotic and AI revolution in that sense. I do think so. It's going to go, that will go fairly quickly. We are in the middle of it. I mean, we have already seen a lot of yeah. transformations. I mean, all the typesetters that were setting books and, and, uh, and newspapers and so on, they are gone since 30 years or whatever when we got the desktop publishing. Yeah? And they have got new, some of them have become desktop publishers. So you have to adapt the labor market to what technology offers. Yeah, yeah, true. This is fascinating. So we're getting a little bit of a peek into the future. As far as so we're we're finding that maybe robots taking over the world and AI adapting and killing everyone is not the main concern we should have. <laughs> the main concern we should have is do we have enough knowledge to use this in a, a positive way forward. So again, I'd like I'd like you to because Peter, you mentioned earlier that um, universities and scientists have a, a big responsibility here in developing methodology that can can really make this AI work. But we also know that a lot of this work is being done by other uh, parties than uh, scientists, maybe within uh, the multinational corporations. Um, are they taking their responsibility in this question as well? What, what do you think? Uh, that's a very good question. I mean, uh, um, this program for uh, protein, uh, 3D protein construction was made by an offshoot of Google. Google is, of course, a commercial company, and they are they they want to sell things. And uh, most of AI has actually been directed as at the, the the general public to make us buy more things. That's what AI is mainly used for. Uh, and we don't know. I mean, as as academics, we don't know very much about what's going on behind the uh, behind the scenes here. So AI is influencing our lives mainly in terms of. Uh, advertisements and, and 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 things like that, and whether that is good or bad, I have no definite opinion. But we should be aware of that. We, we I think, people in general are not aware of how much they are actually manipulated by the uh, by uh, the big companies. Kista, do you have a, an opinion as well here to kind well, of finish I, this? I, I agree, and all the algorithms that was used in the Brexit and the Trump uh, uh, election, for example, it's very good example of of manipulation manipulation uh, by algorithms, intelligent algorithms, and of course, this is extremely dangerous. Uh, it's a democrat a democracy issue, I think. I also think that governments uh, should take more active, uh, be more active here, not only in putting taxes on these companies, but in somehow formulating rules for how you can uh, influence people. Uh, and and uh, th- that's, a, for me, a very difficult problem. But I, I think we, we the, um, uh, the, 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 the national governments need to take more, more uh, initiatives here. So we need, need to put an ethical... Uh, perspective on that as well, I guess, and and uh, getting the lawyers involved, <laughs> maybe as well, both sides, I suppose. Before we finish off, we only have a couple of minutes left. I do have one question from uh, the Facebook chat, and this is for you, Peter. <laughs> and this is obviously from from some sort of student, uh, because I'm not sure what half the this means. But you will, Peter, so answer it. Uh, what did Peter have to say about the limitation of neural networks and ML in relation to Fodor's argument about modularity of the mind versus central processing? Um, I don't believe in the modularity of the mind. I think Fodor is totally wrong. So that's my 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 first part of the uh, of the answer. Um, then. 
And uh, no, no, of course, it, it, it relates because if modularity was correct, then we could, it would be easier to, to create systems that handle these modules. Uh, and uh, the, the central processing uh, folder is, is still stuck with the Turing machine analogy of, of the human brain. And, and I think that's, a, that, that's a, a big mistake. We know much more about the brain now. There is no central processor in, in, in the brain. And the modularity, there is some, but it's, 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 it's quite weak. So um, in, in, in general, I think that this uh, idea of modularity is, is not worth uh, uh, continuing working on. Uh, on the other hand, I don't know what we should work on uh, because we know, still don't know enough about how the brain solves these problems. So uh, we, we, uh, I have no co real constructive um, alternative to, to provide here. But hopefully we will. Right, because this we work on constantly and it is a forward motion and we have to try to keep up. Guys, thank you so much. This has been a fascinating discussion and I'm sure we could have gone on for another hour. <laughs> but we do have a couple of other speakers that we'd like to invite today. And I think that a couple of questions that you guys have been asking yourself in front of the computer today will be answered by some of the talks coming up. So Peter and Krista, thank you so much for joining us. It's been an absolute pleasure and we'll hope to see you again soon. Thank you and so much. Thank you guys. And for the rest of you, it's time to take...